Hello again everyone. Today we start a new unit that is probably my favorite stuff in the entire course, so sex and sexual selection. Um, we're going to cover a lot of topics in this unit, but this module is going to focus on the idea of why did sex evolve at all. So let's start with a knowledge check that's reviewing your understanding of migration. So take a few minutes to go through these options and think about which ones a biologist would agree with. Good luck. Okay, so now let's focus back on the new material. So in this unit, um, unit seven, we're gonna talk about why creatures, um, and not just creatures, organisms reproduce sexually. Um, why are there different sexes in a lot of species? Um, how many individuals should one mate with to get the highest fitness? And then what is sexual selection and how is it the same or different than natural selection? And then we'll go through some forms of sexual selection. So for today, we're going to focus in on this. As soon as I get my pen going here. We're focusing in here. All right, so why reproduce sexually? And when I was an undergrad, this was actually one of the first questions that really sort of blew my mind, like that we didn't know why something this common, why it evolved, right? And so we're going to talk about why we think it evolved, but we need a lot more evidence before we know that for sure, all right? But today we're going to kind of explore that topic. Specifically, we're going to hit on these things. So we're going to talk about possible modes of reproduction that are found in nature and just the evidence that it doesn't have to be sex. Um, we're going to talk about the costs of sex, which are large, and then we're going to talk about the potential benefits of sex. So to get us going, let's get some definitions down and make sure we're all on the same page here. So let's start with what asexual reproduction is. So in asexual reproduction, offspring arise from a single organism and they inherit, there's an N in there, they inherit genes from that parent only. All right, so like cloning, for example, is, is a really common way of doing this. All right, so now sexual reproduction in contrast, in contrast is that offspring arise from two individuals combining gametes. So those two individuals are combining gametes, which are haploid, right? So only have half the genes from each individual or half the copies. So then that means that the offspring inherit genes from both parents. And this, this combination of two individuals coming together to make an offspring allows something new. It allows for the shuffling of genetic combinations of both parents. through recombination. 
right? So the offspring aren't a clone of either parent. They're a unique combination of each parent's alleles. And um, asexuality, um, in terms of reproduction, not in terms of a sexual orientation in humans, right? But we're talking about in terms of, of a reproductive strategy, is, is somewhat common um, in, in the organisms we tend to focus on. So it's about 1% of plants. and um, about 0.1% of animals. And it's way more common in other groups of organisms. So the point here is that sexual reproduction and having different sexes the human sort of normal, right? This is the, the average thing in our communities is not necessarily normal across the natural world. There's lots of different ways of reproducing. So we're gonna go through a, like four different examples here of ways of reproducing asexually. So the first one is used very commonly um, in bacteria, for example, which is one of the largest uh, groups of organisms on this planet. Um, essentially, they do cell division. They don't have any sexes. They don't go through meiosis. There's no fusion of haploid gametes, but they produce their offspring simply through cell division or what we might call cloning. Another method that doesn't require sex at all is called parthenogenesis. And this is a really cool example because parthenogenic organisms seem like they evolved from sexual organisms. So it's a loss of sex that leads to parthenogenesis. So in parthenogenesis, the species is all made up of one sex and those sex still produce gametes, they produce haploid eggs, and then those haploid eggs duplicate and then undergo meiosis within one organism. So they're basically self-fertilizing and it doesn't require another sex to produce offspring. So again, they're doing this on their own. It's asexual reproduction. And one of the what most well-studied versions of parthenogenesis is in these whiptail lizards um, found in the US. And then there are other species that have found ways to make sex optional. They do it when it, they want to, essentially when it's to their advantage, but they don't have to do it. So plants are a good example of this. A lot of plants will produce what we call runners, which are just new plants that are genetically identical to the parent. Um, and those runners are, are clones, right? And so they're asexual reproduction. They can also produce through sex by a fertilization with, with another plant. This should have a T here, um, but they don't have to. All right, so this is an example of sex optional. They can use asexual reproduction or they can use sexual reproduction. Another example of a mode of reproduction where sex is, or sex is optional are um, simultaneous hermaphrodites. So a lot of, um, for example, sea slugs are simultaneous hermaphrodites. And basically they produce um, sperm and eggs. So they produce all the gametes they need um, to reproduce and they can fertilize their own eggs with their own sperm. So they don't need a partner, right? But they can also fertilize a partner and so they can reproduce sexually or asexually. Um, many flowering plants also can do this because they have um, stamens and pistils, right? So eggs and sperm in the same flower and so can either self or fertilize other plants. So again, the point here is that sexual reproduction isn't necessarily the law, right? It, it, under some circumstances, it seems like asexual reproduction is the better way to go about it. And we're gonna talk about why that is. <laughs>
So I want to start with a brainstorm here. Um, take a few minutes to think through what you think the costs and benefits might be of sexual reproduction relative to asexual reproduction. I'd like you to try to come up with three, and at least one of them is, in a, is a cost, and at least one of them is a benefit. And so my hint here is to just think about the costs and risks and benefits of having two humans come together to produce offspring. Um, versus producing your own offspring, or thinking about, if you want to, the biology of meiosis and the potential costs of meiosis for individuals. So please take a couple minutes and jot down your ideas in the play posit on the side. Okay, great. So what I'm going to do now is go through the costs of sex that scientists have identified and I'm gonna kind of lay them out, not in the order of importance, but in the order of the likelihood I think it is that, that you mentioned it, okay? So the, the first cost that I think is pretty common to think about is what we're calling a search cost. Okay, so here's the deal. If you're sexually reproducing, so sexually reproducing, individuals have to find each other. To be able to mate. So to produce offspring, you have to find a mate. And that um, could cost you a lot of things. So you could lose time. That could be spent mostly gathering resources is what we're gonna contrast this with. So time that could be used to gather resources for survival. The other thing that you could lose is energy. Maybe you thought of it in terms of like an expense cost, like money with humans, but the budget that most organisms are worried about is energy. So energy that could be used again to gather resources for survival. And then the other thing you could lose is your life. Being out in the world is dangerous, right? And so one of the most risky times for organisms is when they're trying to find mates because they're purposely making themselves visible, right? So risk of predation, This was unlikely maybe to be one that you thought of for humans, but in the organismal world, this is true. So risk of predation high when looking for mates. So there's a lot of costs here, energy, time, and then a potential risk to survival. And this is all in contrast to asexually reproducing individuals Don't have to worry about any of this. So don't have to spend time and energy or take risks to find a mate. Their mate is right there with them at all times, right? It's just themselves. Another potential cost of sex 
is the risk of sexually transmitted diseases, or more generally, the risk of sexually transmitted infections. Essentially, mating provides an effective means of transmitting pathogens. Right? So essentially, to mate, two organisms have to be, get really close to each other. They're exchanging fluids, all of that stuff. That's a great way to pass pathogens. So again, asexual individuals don't have to worry about this. The third cost of sex is reduced relatedness. This is also known as the cost of meiosis. All right, and the idea here is that sexual individuals are only half as related to their offspring as asexual individuals. Okay, and we can see that down here. So if we look at this image, we've got alleles at three loci, um, and the alleles in this individual are big A, big A, little b, little b, and big C, big C, right? And in an asexually reproducing individual, all of their offspring 100% share those alleles. They passed on all their alleles, right? So 100% of genes in offspring from this parent. But in sexual reproduction, right, you're combining the gametes of two individuals. And so even though we've got this same, we've got our focal individual here, the offspring now only one allele right, at each gene is from that parent. So 50% of genes in offspring from the focal parent. So in that way, you're having halving, like one half, um, of your genetic contribution to the next generation, okay? And evolution is only concerned with what you pass on to the next generation. So if you're passing on double the number of your genes to the next generation, you're, in evolutionary terms, you're doing better, all right? So again, let's go through why this happens. So only passing half of alleles to offspring because 50% 
meiosis generates haploid gametes. This halves the relationship or the relatedness of parents and offspring. And what this means is that for the same amount of energy expended, So the energy to do go through these cell divisions, right? And produce energy to produce one offspring. Individuals reproducing asexually produce twice as many copies of their genotypes as those reproducing sexually. So sex cuts in half your genetic contribution to the next generation. That's a cost. So our fourth cost, and we're st you can see we're starting to rack up all these costs. There's a lot of cost to sex. The fourth big cost to sex is called the twofold cost of sex. Uh, other people, and sometimes I think this helps people remember it better, excuse me, um, call it the cost of males. And here's the idea. The production of males and it doesn't have to be males, but it just it has to be a sex that doesn't directly produce its own offspring. We're calling them males, right? So the production of males in a sexual population reduces its reproductive potential by half. So let's walk through why this is true. In sexual populations, One sex, and this is usually males, cannot themselves produce their own offspring. Okay, so here, basically what we're saying is that males, and we're talking about males in terms of sex and not gender, right? But males can, essentially can't get pregnant, right? They can't produce their own offspring on their own, right? They don't leave behind offspring. They have to go through someone else 
to produce offspring, right? And so the image, the first image on the right kind of shows you this. So here's a sexual population and an asexual population. Let's say that each female leaves behind only two offspring, right? In a sexual population, half of those offspring will be male. And so those males don't leave behind their own offspring. So you can see that in each generation, essentially in this lineage, each female is reproducing one other individual who can leave behind their own offspring. And so this lineage leaves behind eight descendants. In an asexual population, now let's look at this one, we don't have the same problem. Because, of, because every clone of the initial parent can produce its own offspring. So even though they're each only still leaving behind two offspring, you're getting 30 descendants in the same amount of time. Right, so it's been four generations, and now you've got 30 descendants from this initial individual versus eight. So in sexual populations, one sex cannot produce their own offspring, and so that limits the growth of the population. In asexual populations, all individuals are essentially female, And all their offspring can produce their own offspring. Thus, Asexual lineages can grow more rapidly each generation because all progeny capable of producing offspring. So the cost of males is the idea that when you become a sexual population, you're cutting your reproductive potential in half because males can't produce their own offspring. So we've just gone through four pretty big costs to sex. And so there have to be some pretty big benefits. So I wanna to talk to you now about one popular idea of a benefit to sex. And this idea is, that, is one that's taught in intro bio, it may have been one that you listed, is that sex is favored because it generates novel genotypes, all right? And it generates these novel genotypes. Um, I actually meant for us to write this together, so you may need to write this in your notes. That it generates these genotypes, these novel genotypes, through recombination during meiosis. Because of recombination, sexual reproduction can produce gametes with unique combinations of alleles from different parents. We mentioned this on like the very first slide about the difference between sex and asexual is that you've got alleles from two different individuals coming together and mixing. So that's often cited as a benefit, but I wanna challenge that idea for a second. So let's think about an analogy. Let's think about a card game. So each card in the deck represents an allele. And let's say that you just won the last card game. Say you're playing poker. I put up a picture here. I think it's a good hand. I don't actually play poker, so I don't, I don't know. Um, but let's say that you won a poker game with a really good hand. 
And now your friends say you want to, they want to play the same game again. So there's going to be a little activity that pops up on the side. And the question is, what would you do if you had the choice? Before this next game, what would you do that would increase your chance to win? Would you shuffle your hand back in the deck and draw new cards? Or would you keep your existing hand? So take a few seconds to think through what would make it more likely that you win the next game of post poker if you won the last one. Okay, so I hope that you saw through that activity that maybe shuffling isn't always the best idea, right? So in a scenario where the rules of the game don't change, so if the rules of the game don't change, then we expect that a winning hand in one game would also do well in the next. Right? So if you had a winning hand and your rules are the same, you're probably going to have a pretty good hand again. So why shuffle that? Why shuffle that and why risk it? Right? So in nature, we can think about the same thing. So for the same reason, if we have a winning hand, and in this case, a winning hand would be an individual that has survived selection. And gets to reproduce. Oops. Sorry about this. Gets to reproduce. Is likely carrying. a good combination of alleles. So if you survive to reproduce, then you probably have a pretty winning hand, right? It got you through a lot. So you have a good combination of alleles. Mixing those alleles with a sexual partner could produce offspring that are less fit because you're shuffling the alleles, right? You're mixing them back together with at least a portion of the deck. So in a stable environment, where selection pressures are the same from generation to generation, from gen to gen. Sexual reproduction is costly. 
So only under certain, under certain conditions. Is it beneficial to shuffle? Okay, so if you're in a stable environment and you have a winning hand, you should just keep that winning hand. And the way to do that is to reproduce asexually. So that's our actual final cost of sex. We're gonna call it separating a winning hand. Why separate a suite of genes that give an individual that gave, let's say this, that gave the parent high fitness. Okay, so separating a winning hand. So if you say on an exam, for example, that one of the benefits of sex is that it generates novel genotypes, and that's all you say, you're gonna get that wrong because there are a lot of conditions where that shuffling is not to an individual's advantage or to their lineage's advantage evolutionarily. Okay, so here is a summary table of the five costs of sex that we've talked about. This table is gonna appear at the end of your notes. You don't need to write this down because you've actually already wrote, writ, written, <laughs> written, I can't talk this morning, most of this down. Um, but I just wanna get it in one place so that we can see that there are a lot of cost to sex. And so for sex to evolve, it has to be really beneficial. Um, and it's actually been challenging uh, to figure out what those benefits are and under what conditions those benefits exist. And so the question of why sex exists is still one that scientists are pursuing, but we're gonna talk about the two big ideas of the benefits of sex now.